This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Studies in Pessimism by Arthur Schopenhauer Chapter 5 Psychological Observations There is an unconscious propriety in the way in which, in all European languages, the word person is commonly used to denote a human being. The real meaning of persona is a mask, such as actors were accustomed to wear on the ancient stage. And it is quite true that no one shows himself as he is, but wears his mask and plays his part. Indeed, the whole of our social arrangements may be likened to a perpetual comedy, and this is why a man who is worth anything finds society so insipid, while a blockhead is quite at home in it. Reason deserves to be called a prophet, for in showing us the consequence and effect of our actions in the present, does it not tell us what the future will be? This is precisely why reason is such an excellent power of restraint in moments when we are possessed by some base passion, some fit of anger, some covetous desire, that will lead us to do things, whereof we must presently repent. Hatred comes from the heart, contempt from the head, and neither feeling is quite within our control. For we cannot alter our heart. Its basis is determined by motives, and our head deals with objective facts and applies to them rules which are immutable. Any given individual is the union of a particular heart with a particular head. Hatred and contempt are diametrically opposed and mutually exclusive. There are even not a few cases where hatred of a person is rooted in nothing but forced esteem for his qualities. And besides, if a man sets out to hate all the miserable creatures he meets, he will not have much energy left for anything else, whereas he can despise them, one and all, with the greatest ease. True, genuine contempt is just the reverse of true, genuine pride. It keeps quiet, and gives no sign of its existence. For if a man shows that he despises you, he signifies at least this much regard for you, that he wants to let you know how little he appreciates you, and his wish is dictated by hatred, which cannot exist with real contempt. On the contrary, if it is genuine, it is simply the conviction that the object of it is a man of no value at all. Contempt is not incompatible with indulgent and kindly treatment, and for the sake of one's own peace and safety, this should not be admitted. It will prevent irritation, and there is no one who cannot do harm if he is roused to it. But if this pure, cold, sincere contempt ever shows itself, it will be met with the most truculent hatred, for the despised person is not in a position to fight contempt with its own weapons. Melancholy is a very different thing from bad humor, and of the two, it is not nearly so far removed from a gay and happy temperament. Melancholy attracts, while bad humor repels. Hypochondria is a species of torment which not only makes us unreasonably cross with the things of the present, not only fills us with groundless anxiety on the score of future misfortunes entirely of our own manufacture, but also leads to unmerited self-reproach for what we have done in the past. Hypochondria shows itself in a perpetual hunting after things that vex and annoy and then brooding over them. The cause of it is an inward, morbid discontent, often coexisting with a naturally restless temperament. In their extreme form, this discontent and this unrest lead to suicide. 
any incident, however trivial, that rouses disagreeable emotion, leaves an after-effect in our mind, which for the time it lasts, prevents our taking a clear, objective view of the things about us, and tinges all our thoughts, just as a small object held close to the eye limits and distorts our field of vision. What makes people hard-hearted is this, that each man has, or fancies he has, as much as he can bear in his own troubles. Hence, if a man suddenly finds himself in an unusually happy position, it will in most cases result in his being sympathetic and kind. But if he has never been in any other than a happy position, or this becomes his permanent state, the effect of it is often just the contrary. It so far removes him from suffering that he is incapable of feeling any more sympathy with it. So it is that the poor often show themselves more ready to help than the rich. At times it seems as though we both wanted and did not want the same thing, and felt at once glad and sorry about it. For instance, if on some fixed date we are going to be put to a decisive test about anything in which it would be a great advantage to us to come off victorious, we shall be anxious for it to take place at once, and at the same time we shall tremble at the thought of its approach. And if, in the meantime, we hear that, for once in a way, the date has been postponed, we shall experience a feeling both of pleasure and of annoyance, for the news is disappointing, but nevertheless it affords us a momentary relief. It is just the same thing if we are expecting some important letter carrying a definite decision, and it fails to arrive. In such cases, there are really two different motives at work in us, the stronger but more distant of the two being the desire to stand the test and to have the decision given in our favor, and the weaker, which touches us more nearly, the wish to be left for the present in peace and quiet, and accordingly in further enjoyment of the advantage which at any rate attaches to a state of hopeful uncertainty compared with the possibility that the issue may be unfavorable. In my head there is a permanent opposition party, and whenever I take any step or come to any decision, though I may have given the matter mature consideration, it afterwards attacks what I have done, without, however, being each time necessarily in the right. This is, I suppose, only a form of rectification on the part of the spirit of scrutiny, but it often reproaches me when I do not deserve it. The same thing, no doubt, happens to many others as well. For where is the man who can help thinking that, after all, it were better not to have done something that he did with great deliberation? Quid tam dextra pete concipus ut te conatus? Non poeni teat votique paracti. Why is it that common is an expression of contempt, and that uncommon, extraordinary, distinguished, denote approbation? Why is everything that is common contemptible? Common, in its original meaning, denotes that which is peculiar to all men, i.e., shared equally by the whole species, and therefore an inherent part of its nature. Accordingly, if an individual possesses no qualities beyond those which attach to mankind in general, he is a common man. Ordinary is a much milder word, and refers rather to intellectual character, whereas common has more of a moral application. What value can a creature have that is not a whit different from millions of its kind? Millions, do I say? Nay, an infiniture of creatures which century after century, in never-ending flow, nature sends bubbling up from her inexhaustible springs, as generous with them as the smith with the useless sparks that fly around his anvil. 
It is obviously quite right that a creature which has no qualities except those of the species should have to confine its claim to an existence entirely within the limits of the species, and live a life conditioned by those limits. In various passages of my works, I have argued that whilst a lower animal possesses nothing more than the generic character of its species, man is the only being which can lay claim to possess an individual character. But in most men, this individual character comes to very little in reality, and they may be almost all ranged under certain classes. Ce sont des espèces. Their thoughts and desires, like their faces, are those of the species or, at any rate, those of the class to which they belong, and accordingly, they are of a trivial, everyday, common character, and exist by the thousand. You can usually tell beforehand what they are likely to do and say. They have no special stamp or mark to distinguish them. They are like manufactured goods, all of a piece. If, then, their nature is merged in that of the species, how shall their existence go beyond it? The curse of vulgarity puts men on a par with the lower animals by allowing them none but a generic nature, a generic form of existence. Anything that is high or great or noble must then, as a matter of course and by its very nature, stand alone in a world where no better expression can be found to denote what is base and contemptible than that which I have mentioned as in general use, namely, common. Will, as the thing in itself, is the foundation of all being. It is part and parcel of every creature, and the permanent element in everything. Will, then, is that which we possess in common with all men, nay, with all animals, and even with lower forms of existence. And in so far we are akin to everything, so far that is, as everything is filled to overflowing with will. On the other hand, that which places one being over another and sets differences between man and man is intellect and knowledge. Therefore, in every manifestation of self we should, as far as possible, give play to the intellect alone, for as we have seen, the will is the common part of us. Every violent exhibition of will is common and vulgar. In other words, it reduces us to the level of the species. It makes us a mere type and example of it, in that it is just the character of the species that we are showing. So every great fit of anger is something common. Every unrestrained display of joy or of hate or fear in short, every form of emotion, in other words, every movement of the will, if it's so strong as decidedly to outweigh the intellectual element in consciousness, and to make the man appear as a being that wills rather than knows. In giving way to emotion of this violent kind, the greatest genius puts himself on a level with the commonest son of earth. Contrarily, if a man desires to be absolutely uncommon, in other words, great, he should never allow his consciousness to be taken possession of and dominated by the movement of his will, however much he may be solicited thereto. For example, he must be able to observe that other people are badly disposed towards him, without feeling any hatred towards them himself. Nay, there is no surer sign of a great mind than that it refuses to notice annoying and insulting expressions, but straightway ascribes them, as it ascribes countless other mistakes, to the defective knowledge of the speaker, and so merely observes without feeling them. This is the meaning of that remark of Gratian, that nothing is more unworthy of a man than to let it be seen that he is one. El mayor testoro de un hombre estar muestras de que es hombre.